Sorry, <laughs> welcome to come through. <laughs> Take a seat with the rest of the presenters. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Good. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I know a lot of you d maybe didn't get as much notice as you would have liked, considering our newsletters didn't exactly go out on time. But it's great that so many of you made it down. Um, so we're just going to give you a small bit of a presentation tonight in regards to our Eastern Bay shared path to Pohonuku. Uh, we've got a few people here to talk to you through design, construction, environmental, and some other aspects. Um, yeah, I'll just hand over to Michael for a karakia. So. Kia hora te marino. Kia whakapapa punamo te moana. He hua hurahi, ma tatu i korangi nei. Aroha atu, pai tatu i atatu katoa, hui e taiki e. Uh, good evening all, kia ora. Uh, Michael Shazan, I'm the project manager for Hot City Council delivering uh, Tupuwa Horonoku. So Tupuwa Horonoku, uh, the project, the scope of the project is going to be a new uh, shared path, including new seawalls, 4.4 uh, kilometers long between uh, Ngao Mat Matau, a point forward, to Makoromiko, uh, Windy Point. Uh, it will be delivered as six bays, but the focus at the moment is delivering the first two bay, which is Sunshine Bay and Makoromiko. Uh, construction is confirmed to begin in a few months. Um, detailed design have been completed for, the, for this uh, first two bays. Uh, we've got issue for construction drawings. So uh, we are undertaking uh, service investigations as well. You might have seen uh, some uh, uh, Hydrovax doing investigations. So, th so that will run for a few weeks, after which we will do some uh, service relocations, the power poles on Sunshine Bay. Uh, the precasts are, uh, uh, are underway as well and looking at delivery later this year. So by uh, late 2022, we'll be constructing the first uh, seawalls at uh, Windy Point, Makoromiko. Uh, again, uh, the project uh, is being delivered by the Tiara Tupua Alliance. So Hot City Council is working alongside Waka Kotahi. Uh, the last, uh, last two, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the Tiara Tupua Alliance project agreement was signed between uh, Waka Kotahi, Downer, Heb, and Tonkin and Taylor. So that marks the establishment of, uh, uh, of the alliance. And they are delivering Nga Oranga Kipitooni in parallel to Pua Horonoku. So we've got a great team on board. So we are gearing up for construction. Thank you. So just, uh, just a, a, an aerial uh, background in terms of uh, the project. So from Point Howard all the way to Makoromiko. So Mark. Mark Foster, who's the design manager from the Tiara Tupu Alliance, will uh, give a background on the design of the project. Uh, Tenakoto, everybody. Uh, yeah, as Michael said, my name's Mark Foster. I'm the design manager for Tiara Tupu Alliance. Um, and I just wanted to give a brief update on uh, the progress of the design over recent months and also a little bit about where to next. So we have, as Michael said, we've completed the design for the first what we call the first two bays, or uh, Sunshine Bay and Makotomiko. Um, and what that's really been has been an evolution of the consent design, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, most of what we've done is in the engineering detail that sits under the ground and then how, how we make it all stand up and how we make it work and how we build it. So most of what we've done is probably invisible, uh, even though a lot of hard work's gone into it. But I just thought I might highlight some of the things that you might see that might be slightly different to what you uh, had seen previously. So one of the things we've done, it's not super clear in this picture, but we've got a much larger landing between the levels of the wall now, and that was around providing safety from falling. So the idea behind that was um, it reduces the need for balustrades and also increases safety for users um, so they don't have as far to fall. Next slide, please, Molly. Um, we've also done things like introduce path markings, as you see here. They are kind of got a dual function around um, trying to give, a, give it a little bit more of a look and feel to the path, um, bring in some cultural narrative to the project, but also located strategically at stairs 
and landings and access points as a bit of a warning for cyclists to slow down because we've got some junctions coming up. Um, next slide, please. And we've also developed the detail of um, the balustrade. There are sections of the path where we need a balustrade for safety reasons, um, and we've been working pretty hard to make that as unobtrusive as possible. Um, so, so the process that we went through, because I'm um, uh, understanding that some of you may be from Sunshine Bay or Windy Point, uh, but you might be from the other bay, other areas as well. The process we went through through this um, is in terms of community involvement. There's a lot of acronyms on here, so I'll explain what they mean. Um, is through what we call the BSUDP, which stands for the Bay Specific Urban Design Process. So that's a process of working through the urban design elements, the things that the pub we think that the community are interested in. And what we did with those two bays, and we'll do again with the others, is first up we do a what we call draft protocols, which is a which is a document that says this is what we think it's going to look like. It's still a reasonably high level document because we don't want to get too caught into the detail before we get feedback and we send that to the community for feedback. So in the previously we sent it to the community groups, uh, the Eastern East Harbour Environment Association and the Community Board. And then we get that feedback and then we provide feedback on the feedback. So we either respond by saying, yes, we'll make these changes or thanks, but actually we can't make the changes for these reasons. And then that's a very transparent process. And at the end of that, we carry on with the design and we also finalise the base specific urban design plans. Bit of a mouthful. So that process will be followed again for the other bays. Um, and uh, all, all going well, that will probably hap that should happen in November, December this year with the other bays. And just the next slide, please, Molly. Um, these are uh, some of the outputs. So this is, a, I'm not expecting anybody to read the detail here, but this is, these are the plans for, this is Sunshine Bay, and the next one is Windy Point. Um, Yeah, gotcha. We'll see what we can do. Um, there we go. Um, don't read the detail though. <laughs> so what? What? Uh, so this, the, these plans are now, uh, now or very shortly, will be going live on the Hutt City Council website, um, which are the more detailed plans that that sit within that urban design plan. So you can see, kind of look, look a bit more closely at the design for those two bays, but do it in your own time because this is obviously a bit hard to read. So that's that's just to let you know that. Either, either now, Ted, or very soon, they'll be up on the, uh, they are now, they're on the Hutt City Council website. Um, so that's the update from design, and I'm going to pass over now to John. <laughs> okay. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Kingsbury. I'm the Head of Transport at Hutt City Council. Um, just before I talk about this, I just want to um, acknowledge the experts in the room. Um, we've, the, uh, the alliance that's been put together for both uh, Tupura Horonuku and uh, Te Aratupura is amazing. Uh, we've got the best of the best people. We've got, um, we've got the real experts on this, so couldn't be prouder to be associated with, a pro with, with either of those projects with having such great people involved. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the resilience benefits of this. So. Very topical, um, obviously, and, and um, I recognise a few faces from, from last week um, around the corner when we, we did the, had a climate change event. So uh, the project will improve the resilience of Marine Drive through the new seawalls, and, and some of you may have seen the wave testing a um, month ago or so, uh, which we, uh, and you know, we can talk about that a little bit later if anyone's got any questions, um, but basically pushing the waves back out rather than bringing them in. Um, <coughs> the new seawalls will be less prone to damage in comparison to what's existing. Um, also have the potential for future resilience upgrades. I mean, we know climate change is real, obviously. We know resilience is a key feature, key thing um, along the eastern bays. So it's not going to solve everything, but it will help, and it's a starting point. Um, as, as, as sea level rises and storm surges get higher, uh, we need to look at, at, at future things, but this, uh, this is the basis for that future. Um, and as we said here, more work's needed to adapt, and uh, we will be, we're looking at that as well. But this is going make to make a big difference, and it's also going to provide, as we all know, a uh, much needed and long overdue shared path um, from Eastbourne through to through Point Howard. Um, I'm not sure who's next. Ah, so over to John. 
Evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Pritchard. I'm one of the construction managers working for the Alliance. Um, so this is what our next 12 months looks like. Um, through the rest of September and, sorry, the rest of August and into early September, we're going to be doing underground service investigations from here up to Point Howard. So we've already done a bit of that. You'll have seen us out there last week. Um, we've got we've got about halfway through that now. We are doing some hopefully geotechnical investigations in and around Lowry Bay and York Bay towards the end of September. Um, we will also be relocating the overhead power lines in Sunshine Bay again, hopefully late September. And we are looking to start work in Mar Coromico in October. Um, each bay will take five to six months, which takes us through to sort of August next year and hopefully by which point we'll be straight into the northern bays. Uh, next slide, Molly. So what does our construction look like? Um, job number one is to remove all of the beach material from underneath our footprint, uh, give us a nice foundation on the wave cut platform out there. We'll be digging a small scour curtain into the front of the seawall, you can see here. Um, once that's done, we've got a good foundation and we start pouring concrete in the hole basically. So we've got an unreinforced concrete foundation that we pour into that and on top of that we have the precast units that Michael mentioned earlier. So they go in the front, they give us our temporary formworks, oh sorry, our permanent formworks and a nice finish on the face of the wall and again more concrete in behind that. Once we're up close to the level of the existing road, we slap a pavement on top of it and that's pretty much job done for us. Next slide. Um, so how are we going to do this? Um, this? This job's really easy to build if it was in a field. It's just a big concrete slab. But we're stuck between a pretty gnarly marine environment and Eastbourne's only road access. So we're going to be setting up a permanent lane closure throughout the duration of the job. So the lane closure is going to be anywhere between two to 300 meters long. Um, and this gives us space to work our lifting machinery, our concrete trucks, our uh, delivery trucks for the precast. Um, so we're going to be skinning up the traveling lane down to about three meters. So whatever we need to do to get the buses through. Uh, out on the seaward side, we're going to be using a temporary barrier that we're bringing up from Christchurch. So the intention to dampen the wave action and give us as dry a site as possible so that we can build this thing as quick. Slide, please, Molly. Um, the traffic management, so as you'll see on some of the cheat sheets knocking around, during peak times and working times, the traffic management is going to be um, manned, so we'll be able to manage the ebbs and flows of the traffic depending which way they're going, um, and outside of those working hours and outside of those peak times, they're going to be automated signals. Um, to help us get our trucks turning around and we don't have to drive through Eastbourne, we're going to be installing a temporary roundabout at the junction of Marine Dr Drive and Marine Parade at the north end of Eastbourne. Um, that stops us having to drive trucks into Eastbourne because there's nowhere to turn around otherwise. Um, Molly, next slide. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Ed, our environment manager. Uh, good evening. Just put a cheap with the says. Um, so this is this is really just identifying some of the, the key things that we're interested in environmental management here. Our, our risks or what we're trying to avoid is um, interfering with penguins, uh, variable oyster catchers, uh, straying beyond the sort of the construction zone, keeping it tight, um, not bringing in any contaminated materials, so making sure the fill that is used on the back behind the wall is, is all clean fill. Um, you won't see any site sheds or anything like that en route. Um, the boys are going to live out, the, out of a ute and a trailer and then they'll have an actual construction yard down in Seaview. So, so again, it's to, to minimise the potential. Um, and it should be a very clean site. John assures me there will be absolutely no rubbish to be seen. Uh, and one of the consent conditions we do have over the duration of the construction is to do regular sweeps th through the beach area from the start of the project to the finish. Um, one of the things we're also going to do is benchmark noise and vibration before we start. So then if people feel there is an effect, we've got something that we can compare against. Uh, next slide, please, Molly. Um, so bird protection, that um, in the consent phase, this became one of the important things that the uh, Eastbourne residents were really keen on ensuring. Um, 
So we cannot work uh, immediately adjacent to uh, a nesting penguin area. There's, there's a setback provisions, there's monitoring requirements. Uh, we have to do sweeps with penguin dogs before we start. Uh, similarly, as we get further to the north, then the variable oyster catchers come in and there's potential for them to be breeding. So again, there's exclusion zones that we have to put in place and monitoring. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, one of the important things is that in looking at these environmental activities that's been done in conjunction with the resource consent conditions, there was a series of provisions in there. Uh, one was the creation of bird protection areas, three of them, um, and a, a prescribed amount, I think it's $300,000, to help fence those. Uh, there's pest control uh, to work with the local pest group here. Um, there's also a variable oyster catcher study, which is also done by the, the local environmental group. Uh, and one of the, the things is also looking at education. So there's a 10-year education program also has to be incorporated. Uh, what we're looking to do is try and fast track the establishment of the bird protection areas. So there's one at Bishop Park and one at Short, which is looking in that June area. Um, to, to help do that, we have to form a thing called the Little Penguin Group, which has sort of got the local interest in this, plus sort of ecologists um, with their specialty being in penguins. So we want to formalise the, the design of that. There's already a, a preliminary plan being prepared, but we've had some feedback that it could be better, so we're just going to look at that. Um, I think that's the main thing from my perspective, and I think the rest of the team, we're really looking forward to... Um, starting work on this project. It's, uh, it's an exciting project and seeing how it links into the other section we're doing between Naronga and Potomac, um, the end result's going to be really exciting. Thank you. Who's next? Cool. So my name's Molly. I'm the Stakeholder and Communications Advisor for Te Pua Horonuku. So I'm just going to run you through some of the ways that we will be trying to keep you informed and aware of what's going on. So we've already got an 0800 number set up for the project, which is written up here and is also on the newsletters that hopefully you've all received by now, along with our project-specific email address. We also have a website linked to the Hutt City website, and on that you'll find a lot of the documents we've talked about tonight. The BSUDPs are on there. Once it's confirmed, the bird protection plan will go up there. Some of the visualisations and some of the things along those lines. Um, we'll also be sending out a physical newsletter, hopefully every quarter, with some updates on what's going on. And we also have an email newsletter, which you can subscribe to via the website, or we've put some sign-up sheets on the table at the back over there. Um, we'll be putting out regular social media updates via the Hutt City Council Facebook page, as well as newspaper advertising in the local news, the Eastbourne Herald and the Hutt News. You may have seen that already. And we'll also be putting some signage boards up throughout the project site with some details. They'll also have the 0800 number and the email address on them. And there'll also be some other information about what's going on. Um, I think that is basically everything from us. So we now have about 15 minutes for some questions and the team will answer if anyone has anything. Yes, sir. So, what was your question? It's John Butt. Um, the, the design of the, uh, the barrier and the ecological impact of erosion doesn't seem to have been kept to the forefront. Um, I've seen three designs of the barrier, uh, each one slightly different. The, the lower edge of the barrier is sometimes a vertical wall. Sometimes it's almost flat, and sometimes it's just a little step where you've got the, uh, the key that holds the, the, place, the barrier in place. Um, I'm sure you would have read D Jim Darm's reports on uh, erosion, especially in Eastbourne, that was prepared for the Hutt City Council 10 years ago, pointing out that a vertical wall creates erosion situation. 
And I'm really concerned that um, the design is changing towards having a bit of a vertical wall at the bottom of, of the curves. I think the curves will probably work over and, and drop, drop the uh, sediment, but the vertical wall will not. And, and I'm really concerned that the design is not, seems to, doesn't seem to be very clear about the impact of that vertical wall. So just to be clear, the, so when you say erosion, are you talking about erosion at the base of the wall? Yeah, cool. Okay. The, uh, so we've definitely taken that into account. I think if you if you recall, John, when he was talking, you could see that little we call a key into the yeah. rock. That's what that key is there for, basically. So, so the wall is founded. All of the wall is keyed into the rock because the rock is quite shallow. So and that's why we dig out the sand at the beach so that we make sure we key it into the rock. So, and that rock is quite hard, and we've got a key that's about this big. So it, it, it basically. Um, Whilst those rocks do erode with time, that's, we're talking hundreds of years into the future before that rock would erode down to that point. So that's how it kind of keeps it in place. I'm sorry you've missed my point slightly, and my fault. Um, <laughs> the, um, I understand the point of the key, and I'm, I, what, what I'm concerned about is erosion in front of the wall. Um, a good example is that the um, Mark Koromiko Bay used to be sand all the way to the road. And that vertical wall has created an erosion situation that has completely eroded all the sand. So it's nearly three metres of sand. Now, there is still sand there, but of course that's all going to go if there's a vertical wall left. And I'm talking about the key actually being the vertical wall. Not very high, but enough to cause erosion. All I can say, <laughs> look, the, we, the, there is, there's been a coastal process assessment that's been done that sort of, that, that the modelling kind of shows that that won't, that, you know, beaches fluctuate with time. And, and what it is, it's not, it's not actually the vertical wall, it's not having a sand source. So if you've got a cliff, the waves hit the cliff, erode some of the cliff and, and redeposit new sand there. So whether it's vertical or whether it's on an angle, it's actually a, having a hard engineered structure is is what causes that, and so I suppose we're, we're, we're there's hard engineered structure along that whole coastline as it is at the moment, and so we're not actually making that any worse than it already is. True, but we could make it better. We've got an opportunity to make it better, and we shouldn't make it just say, oh, we can do the same. You know, the fact that they made it really bad 50 years ago doesn't make an excuse for making it the same again. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. sir. I'm just going to, if you want to email us, we'd be happy to go back and forth with you about this for a bit longer, well, but just to give everyone else an opportunity to have some questions. I, I will just say just briefly, I think, I, I can kind of hear what you're saying, but we're kind of traversing, there's, there's many balance, things that balance that got us to this particular point, um, which was a couple of years ago, and we can't traverse old, you know, the, 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 the counter is that you have more reclamation or whatever it might be to, to counteract that, and there's a fine balance that's been reached and so happy to talk about it offline but it is it is old kind of stuff that's already been been closed out previously. You have a question here? Can I have a, a, just a quick note on that the reason um, lately is that um, sea walls were thought to cause um, erosion in front of the vertical surface because of the sand you know being turned around but they have found in a lot of American studies that in fact it just goes out and comes back in again. So as you say, and as you know, we did worry about that, but it's not so much a worry now. More of more more the case is that something solid is in the way of sand being cycled, and that's true anyway because the road's there. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so it does come and go. Yeah. You had a question over here, sir. Yeah, kia ora. I'm Quentin Duffy, uh, candidate for Greater Wellington Regional Council. My question is, with any project like this involving heavy machinery next to the marine environment, there's a, a risk of um, a fuel spill or other chemical spill into the marine environment. So I'm interested in what's the um, containment and uh, remediation and, and that sort of what's the, the, the processes in place to 
lower that risk and then to uh, uh, fix it if it happens. Kia ora. No, that, that's a very good question. Um, one of the things we have to prepare in advance of starting work for certification by the Regional Council is our Construction Environmental Management Plan, uh, which we're just finalising at the moment. So in looking at the, the issue of um, contaminants from fuel or other hazardous products in the construction process we were addressing, the refuelling, um, we'll have no fuel stored on site, it will just come in on a daily basis with a mini tanker which will have a, a set filling regime. There will be a spill kit available at all times, um, with also a boom to pick it up and a contingency and then a requirement in that to, to ring the Regional Council's hotline and then depending on the size of that, then it, it, it sort of triggers the whole regional or national response to the spill. Uh, the other thing we're doing is going to minimise the vehicles which are down on that, so there'll be mostly just one as it excavates and then puts it back up onto the road. Uh, and then there's also a requirement to daily inspection of vehicles to make sure they're in good condition. Uh, and that, that also talks about the exhaust as well, so they have to be quiet, running efficiently. Awesome. Do we have any other questions over here? Just a question about pavement quality. The existing section of shared path that's been in, around in the southern part of York Bay for some time, from day one it had a very poor pavement. It was up and down and it's remained that way and got even worse. And I think in part that was because the actual section to be paved was too narrow for a conventional paving machine. So I would hope that this construction results in a better standard of final finished pavement. Is there a question in there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what would that be? Just wondering what the quality of pavement's going to be like. John? Feels like a question. It's probably, yeah, it's probably more me. Um, yes, no, you, you're, we're good there. Uh, so, yeah, so the shared path, we have an average width uh, it, it will vary, but we have an average kind of edge to edge width of about three metres, which fits a paving machine. And we have a hard, we've got a um, hard concrete edge on the roadside, and we've got the nib of the wall on the seaward side, so we've got something to butt up against, because often that's the problem if you kind of, it's probably as you're pointing out, right on the edge there. And one of the other things we've actually looked at, um, this is more applicable to the northern bays, um, is also um, where you have a lot of overtopping the rate of that overtopping is actually asphalt pavements also don't cope too well with that. So more so in the northern bays where we've got high rates of overtopping, we're currently proposing a concrete footpath instead of asphalt for that reason as well. Awesome. Any other questions? Back. Sorry if it's uh, been said before, but um, just going right back to um, the... Two or three times a year, um, or not designed? No, unfortunately not. So the the returns, the returns, the curves that you see, um, they act to kind of push the waves up as opposed to sort of directly across the road. But really, it's you need to raise the level um, to 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 reduce the amount of over, you know, the frequency of overtopping. And that would require raising the road, which is, a, as John alluded to earlier, is a, is, a, is, a, is a longer term aspiration and a longer conversation. But the design as it stands at the moment effectively um, will, the waves in some sections, they now kind of like shoot across the road because there's almost a ramp that has, helps them do that. These will shoot them up in the air, but then obviously with the spray from the wind, it's still kind of, you still have a reasonable amount of, um, of overtopping. And those events will happen just as frequently. I'm Stan, I've been here about 30 years, and just to follow up on that, the southern end of York Bay has, in fact that may well be representative of it there, has to me been very successful with its reverse curve to slop the waves back on themselves. During the recent serious surges, that area was virtually untouched. Is that, in fact, going to be the recipe for the rest of the wall, especially around Windy Point? Yeah, so we've got those same curves um, and and they do, they help in certain waves but not 
but not all wave climates. Um, and we've, we've tested them in the laboratory and found that they do, they do return the waves. But when you get a really big day, it's kind of like the small to medium ones that gets pushed that way, whereas the larger ones, not so much. Any more questions? Are you planning to have a narrower shared path in the small bays? I can't recall uh, exactly what the widths are in the various places, but no, it's more, it's more about the constraints between, um, you know, it's a very constrained site, as you know, and so we're looking to maximise path width, but where we have a larger fall, because we have those steps on the walls, it narrows it up, but on average, um, and, and it's reasonably consistent on the northern four bays and a little bit less consistent on Sunshine Bay and Windy Point. But on average, we have about a three metre clear width, which in, um, in technical terms is referred to as sort of a 2.5 metre usable width because we consider the, if you're on a cycle, if you're on a bike in particular, the, the edges, it's sort of people don't stray into those areas. But the clear width is about three metres consistently. Sometimes it's a bit bigger, sometimes it's a little bit less. and um, the fact that we have bus stops. And so the, the shared pathway I know best is in New Plymouth. And there are parts of that that are very wide near the city. But there are parts of it that become down to one metre because it makes sense for that area. Surely we could do something similar here and retain the bus stops where they are makes sense and hopefully we'll get a crossing to our bus stops and have the path go in front of the bus stop because it's not going to be three metres wide. It could be one metre or one and a half. I think that's something that we, when we go through the Bay specific urban design process and we can go through the plans, we can that's the sort of stuff we can work through then. We are trying from a pure transport perspective, obviously there's a desirable to have, is have, have, a, have, a, have a wider width, but there are, there are areas where there's trees and bus stops and the like where we do have constrictions. So I think that's probably to be worked through at a detailed level at per, per bay. Yeah, I guess that's important for us, mm. because we are the minority um, alongside this path. And another um, shared pathway I know is in Otago on the peninsula and they have incorporated trees and, in fact, gardens all the way along the shared path. So that's another way of looking at it. Awesome. Yeah, we will be going through the full process for the Northern Bays as well, so you'll have plenty of time to comment on the designs at that point. Um, do I see another question over there, sir? All right. Well, this is a question that I should know the answer to, but I've decided to ask it anyway. What is the meaning, the, the significance of Tupua Horonuku? Anybody want to do that? Michael, John? Do you want to do it? I'll give, uh, apology, I'll, I'll try and give an abridged version. So um, the creation of the uh, Whanganui Ataba, Atara, the harbour, was created by uh, two uh, in sort of mythology by two tupua, uh, and one is called Horonuku, and the other is called Fataitai. And the um, tupua Horonuku, so the tupua, whose name is Horonuku, is, was down this uh, eastern side of the harbour, and Fataitai went down the western side of the harbour. And that's why this part of the path is referred to as tupua Horonuku. Uh, road bikes travel at about um, 25, 30 kilometres an hour. Will this uh, pathway be suitable for them? Yeah, I feel like someone else needs a turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so we do have uh, what's called the design speed that we designed the road for. And um, because, of its, because of how narrow it is, being a shared path, the design speed is 20 kilometres per hour. So that... What that dictates from an engineering perspective is there are certain curves 
and sight distances, and obviously if you're travelling faster, your sight distance is less. So this is designed as a 20 kilometre per hour path. We can't stop people going faster. Hopefully they go slower. Um, but that's what the sort of, in terms of safety design and sight lines and those sorts of things, it's a 20 kilometre per hour path. feel when we're passing these guys on these road bikes is that it's um, very, very narrow in places and they swing out and it's very, very dangerous. So how do we get them onto the shared pathway rather than on the road? <laughs> Build the path and they will come. <laughs> <laughs> That's the theory. <laughs> Question over here? Yeah. The information talks about adding a wall later on. The walls I've seen perhaps might be half a metre wide at the base. Has allowance been made on the pathway for what you might call the intrusion of a wall onto the pathway? If it's going to be plonked on top and it's half a metre wide at the bottom, mm. that's half a metre off the width of the path. Correct. Yep. Uh, so, no, that, but, but ultimately, well, so there's two ways to, to protect, to raise it. There's a, you can have a barrier so that the road stays at its existing level um, and that doesn't reduce the path width. Or if you raise the road, you're kind of looking at a much bigger kind of infrastructure piece that, that kind of is rebuilding the road anyway and re reimagining how wide that path is and that, that's a bigger piece. This is not your area, but we've all experienced the storm damage around the bays this, this uh, winter. Who and when is someone going to make the decision to build a wall? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we're, we're not in a position to make that decision yet. Those discussions, as we start looking at resilience across the city, um, we'll start looking at that, but this is the design we have at the moment. But also to, just to back up um, what Mark just mentioned, we wouldn't, you know, in the future, we're not looking at reducing the width of this path. We want more people walking and cycling. We don't want less, so we don't want to go any, any narrower, so we'd need to look at other options uh, in, the, in the future. So. Cool. Do yeah. Very quick one. Could we um, ask that the um, concrete riprap be removed as you go around the bays? <laughs> because, you know, people just accept it now, but it would be nice if that went. And if you could cut it away when you're... That would be brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah. Firstly, uh, well, the part that's had the highest media profile is Lowry Bay throughout the country, actually. And I'm just wondering there about what you're going to do. That's one question. And the other is about beach, beach replenishment and what's going to happen about that because as you widen that wall the, and it will encroach on the beach, uh, the beaches get smaller. And I have heard that you went to the climate change meeting and the first speaker was a, a leading expert internationally and he, was, he talked very precisely and uh, with very good research to back him about that as a real concern. And it's the biggest concern in Wellington Harbour and I have actually uh, spoken to other experts about that. Leading experts. So, can someone else that? so just to clarify, the first question was about what we're doing in Lowry Bay yes. and the second question was about... The yeah. So and the second question was about beach replenishment. I'll answer the first part. So, um, as we kind of mentioned earlier, we just we've designed the first two bays. Um, we we'll start, you know, as work will start shortly around the remaining four bays um, and how they will be designed. So, so that yeah. So a little, a little bit early. So, but in terms, just to in case we get a question, we we haven't. Whilst the original thinking was we'd go in order from here uh, back towards Point Howard, that's not necessarily. We're not sure yet. We need to work through that. So, if, if a bay like Lowry Bay takes a little bit longer to design because of because of the environmental you know the resilience and the, the, the you know the special nature of that bay then that might not be next that might be a little bit later on but we're not we, we're not at that stage yet um, yeah that, that's not me <laughs> um, yeah so yeah, you're right beach um, nourishing the beach or having more sand on the beach is beneficial and I apologies I can't remember exactly which Beach as it is, but the, where there are three or four, Michael, uh, of of the beaches, 
as we move around in the northern bays where beach replenishment is, or we call it beach nourishment, is proposed um, to, to, for exactly the reason that you pointed out. Aha. I'm looking at three local sources. I haven't settled on one yet. Sorry. Um, Where's Golden Bay? No, I'm definitely not importing beach material from the South Island. I'm looking at three local sources. Awesome. Thank you so much for your questions, guys. If you do have any more, you're welcome to email us on the project email. One last question. Larry Bay, this is <clears throat> surely the elephant in the room. What is planned for Days Bay? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Wait, wait, great one to finish off. Um, so, as I'm sure you're all aware, Days Bay isn't one of the one of the six bays that's, that's within this project. Um, I'm not sure why that was long before I got here. Uh, but those decisions were made. Sorry about the feedback. Um, we are looking at Days Bay separately. Um, so there's a Williams Park project looking at looking at you know Williams Park. We've also got um, we've done some original uh, sorry, initial thinking around um, you know the area between the wharf and Williams Park and what they might mean in terms of crossings. Um, so that work is has been started. Uh, we're, yeah, I can't give you any time frames on that yet, but we're, it is it is underway. The, the design design thinking. So, is it being separately yes. Has that funding been assigned? So we've we've got funding. Sorry, I keep giving feedback. Uh, we've we've got some funding to do some design within council, but in terms of conversations with uh, central government, not at this stage yet. Awesome. We just had one final question about the overall timeline of the project when we're expecting to be finished with all the days. Anyone wants to answer that one? Uh, all being well, I've got to get this right, February 2026? Awesome. Yeah, we'll call it there on questions, guys. Thank you again. Um, yeah, like I say, if you do have any further questions, you're welcome to email us and we'll get back to you. We also have the 0800 number set up, which is on the website or on our newsletters. And like I say, we'll be sending out email newsletters fairly regularly, so feel free to sign up there. Um, I'll pass over to John Kingsbury for some closing remarks. I hope I haven't turned it off. <laughs> on? Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming tonight. Um, we realise the amount of interest um, in this project in the community, um, long overdue as I mentioned earlier, um, it's great to have, great to have so many passionate people in the room who, who, who you know want the same thing as us. We you know we want this to be successful, uh, hence we've got the best team that's possible to get. So um, and we look forward to keeping the, keeping you up to date and talking to you throughout the process. Um, and um, yeah, as Molly was saying, plenty of ways to interact with us. We want to make sure we don't um, drown you in information. But you know you have lots of options to, to keep up to date. So um, yeah, if there are any questions, feel free, uh, either on the on the phone or, or via email uh, or those other mediums. So thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, this is an outstanding turnout. So uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. I think Michael's just going to give a closing karakia. Kia tau te mana kitanga, kia runga kitena. Ki tēnā o tātou, ki ia piki te ora, ki ia piki te mana matanga, ki ia hoki pai atu, ki ia hoki pai mai, tuturu whaka mau, mauna, ki ia tina homi e, hui e, taiki e.